You ever come to a symposium and wonder what made that man or woman become what he is now or she is talking about? And I, I do that all the time. And Clarkson's talk um, brought me back, actually. So I will, uh, I'll just give you an idea of why I do what I do. Um, I was uh, uh, born and raised in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, my father, when he had a job, was a truck driver when he wasn't gambling I, at the racetrack in New York. And my mom was a bookkeeper. Um, and I was a student, and um, I had an interest in science, but uh, like uh, um, many uh, uh, teenage American boys, I had a greater interest in girls. And uh, uh, there was this one particular girl that I took a shine to, as we used to say. And um, her father was a professor at Yale. And I think in an effort to distract my attentions from his only daughter, he offered me a work-study position in his laboratory, and then, I, which I took. He was a molecular biologist back in the days of uh, recombinant DNA technology just starting. And the reason I tell that story is because in the time that I was in his lab before, during high school, during, at Yale, and um, then afterwards, I met a number of remarkable people. Elizabeth Blackburn, who you saw as uh, the discoverer of the telomere structure, actually started her work in his lab as a graduate student and worked on the telomeres of chromosomes of a protozoan called Tetrahymena piriformis, which I always had to make the culture broth for and it really stunk. Um, that was part of my job. Um, but that's how I knew her, a very nice um, woman. Um, and uh, Janet Rowley, who discovered the Philadelphia chromosome, did a sabbatical in Joe Gall's lab because that was my mentor. Uh, he discovered G banding and so she learned it from him. And then um, over the summers, um, I got to be a laboratory assistant at a course in molecular cytogenetics at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. I didn't think Cold Spring Harbor was anything more than the title of a, a, a Billy Joel song, but it's actually a, a molecular biology lab. It was uh, run by uh, Jim Watson of Watson and Crick. And uh, during that, uh, those summers there when I wasn't um, visiting the beach where there really was a very cute lifeguard on duty. I was um, doing my job in the laboratory and Barbara McClintock was there. So imagine one day, I'm, uh, it's after dinner and my son now is reading in his biology textbook and I look down and there's that picture of Barbara McClintock and I, I said, oh, I worked with, with her when I was at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. And it was just uh, amazing. And, and now he wants to go into, into medicine. So, so, um, and then I went to medical school and loved clinical medicine and taking care of patients and realized that my true calling was to take that education in molecular biology and apply it to um, a field of medicine where uh, genetics and molecular genetics is obviously important and driving um, our treatments and that's in um, hematology and uh, hematologic malignancies. So that's how I got here. Um, these are my disclosures from yesterday. The ones to pay particular attention to would be Celgene, um, who um, used to have um, azacitidine but lost exclusivity. So I'll be mentioning azacitidine. Uh, Sunesis, I'm on a scientific steering committee for a trial that, um, uh, uh, of a drug that uh, I'll talk about. Seattle Genetics, um, where we're gonna talk about um, an investigational agent, Celator, uh, the same thing. So I'm gonna to talk to you about acute myeloid leukemia in older people. And when we think of acute leukemia, you usually think of kids, um, because when children get cancer, it's usually acute leukemia, more commonly acute lymphoblastic leukemia than acute myeloid leukemia. But actually, the incidence of acute myeloid leukemia increases with advancing age. You can see this data here from Sweden shows that the median age is actually 72 in their population, very accurate, because every cancer case is, um, is uh, registered um, in, in Sweden. About a quarter of these patients had an antecedent hematologic disorder like MDS that you heard about, which often uh, leads to a worse prognosis in AML. And about one in 20 patients have treatment-related AML. In other words, people have been cured of another malignancy with um, chemotherapy only to come down with a um, typically fatal complication of acute myeloid leukemia. Now over the years, we have improved the outcome of younger patients with acute myeloid leukemia. I'm showing you data from the United Kingdom, 
where in the top panels for patients under the age of 59, you can see in successive years that the outcomes have improved. This is mostly due to the fact that we can treat younger patients, much like the pediatric population, with very intensive chemotherapy, high-dose cytarabine being a major component of that, and allogeneic stem cell transplantation. You cannot apply those intensive therapies to older people, and the biology of the disease, as I'll show you, is different in older people. So we've really not made any inroads into the survival of these patients, and yet, this is the largest population. And so the standard of care that's been developed is a standard of care that uh, really applies to the minority of patients with this disease. So let's talk about um, uh, what are the prognostic factors in this disease. Um, all of these, most of these slides are in your handout. I usually just throw the slides up there to make a point as we go along, not to go through every number. This is data from the Southwest Oncology Group that shows that in their studies of patients over the age of 55, the complete remission rate with intensive chemotherapy was lower than that in younger patients under the age of 55. So only a, about 50% or less of patients over the age of 55 even achieved a remission with um, standard chemotherapy. There was a higher incidence of resistant disease. Now one of the most important features that has directed uh, the outcome of these patients is the performance status of patients. What I'm showing you here is the performance status at the time of diagnosis in AML patients in Sweden, but it's very similar to the United States if we were to have such data. I'm certain it will look very similar. In the or uh, burnt orange and uh, light blue um, bars, those are patients with performance status of zero to one, which means they may have a, cut back a little bit on their activities um, or not at all, as opposed to performance status of two or greater, which means they're spending increasing amounts of time in bed um, and not being able to uh, ultimately do activities of daily living. That's performance status four. And as you can see, with advancing age after the year uh, about 60, the number of people with poor performance status goes up. This translates into a higher early mortality in our clinical trials. So patients who have performance status of two or um, three who are over the age of 75, all the way over there on the right-hand side of the slide, had a 50 to 80% risk of death in the first 30 days after starting chemotherapy. Imagine how that conversation goes. You have a life-threatening illness we might be able to get it into a remission about 50% of the time, but you have almost an equal chance of spending your last days in the hospital suffering from the toxicities of that chemotherapy. Some of the genetics, we've worked out the genetics of this disease over the last several decades, showing that um, patients who are older often have multiple chromosomal abnormalities, and I'll show you a patient like that. So over the age of 75, half of the patients had unfavorable risk karyotypes, which are typically structural and numeric changes in the number of chromosomes. And this correlates then with not only the chance of achieving a remission, patients who have multiple cytogenetic changes, only 26% of them in this United Kingdom study achieved a remission, and their five-year survival was only 2%. Again, a French study showing that patients who have high-risk cytogenetic changes, loss of chromosome five or seven, and certain other cytogenetic changes are just complex karyotypes. You could see their survival is very poor. It is the um, survival curve that goes basically to zero before 18 months with intensive chemotherapy. But not every cytogenetic change is associated with a poor prognosis in older patients. There are uh, two that are called the core binding factor translocations. They only occur in about 5 to 10 percent of older AML patients, but there is some chance of long-term survival and a very high uh, chance of getting them into a remission with standard chemotherapy. As time has gone on, we've learned about these genetic changes that occur during the lifetime of our patients in the bone marrow cells and are likely very important in the pathogenesis of the disease. And these genetic changes at, uh, right now are used primarily as prognostic factors because we have found outcome is often linked to the presence or absence of certain cytogenetic changes. It is getting much more complicated as we are now able to very quickly sequence the entire genome of a patient's cancer and see all of the 
genetic changes that are there. But just to give you a glimpse at to how we use this information, I'll, I'll show you two of the most commonly mutated genes in AML. One is the FLT3 uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. This is a very important molecule in normal hematopoiesis, because remember, your bone marrow isn't stagnant. It is responding to extra, cell, extra um, medullary signals, signals coming from the rest of the body in terms of anemia, an infection somewhere, bleeding, to produce more blood cells, and the bone marrow has to be able to sense that. It does it through receptors. This is one of many, the FLT3 receptor. And when the FLT3 ligand binds to this, it activates the internal part of that protein, which then sets a, 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 in motion a series of events that leads to proliferation of bone marrow cells to make more blood. So this is normal. In 25% of acute myeloid leukemia patients who apparently have normal chromosomes, when you look at the chromosomes under the microscope, 25% of them will have a mutation called the internal tandem duplication that activates this tyrosine kinase. So the cell always thinks it's being stimulated. In fact, if you insert that gene into a mouse bone marrow cell, the mouse gets a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And for some reason, we have found that that is associated, and we don't know why, but it's associated with a worse prognosis. And this is also true in older patients here, both disease-free and overall survival in red was worse when the patient has an internal tandem duplication compared to what's called wild type. Wild type, people ask me, what does wild type mean? That, that's normal, that's a genetics term for the wild type mouse that we usually study. The other gene that is highly mutated uh, or commonly mutated in AML is a housekeeping gene called nucleophosmin. Nucleophosmin's job is to build ribosomes. So um, um, RNA is made in the nucleus of a cell and transported out into the cytoplasm, and that's ribosomal RNA, around which proteins accumulate to make a ribosome very important in making proteins. What I'm showing you in the top panel in green is, in red are nuclei, and in green shows you where nucleophosmin normally is in a cell. It's in nucleoli and in the nuclear envelope. When this gets mutated, um, a, a tetranucleotide insertion is into the last coding exon, and what it does is it causes the protein no longer to be localized in the nucleus, but to be localized in the cytoplasm, as shown in the bottom um, uh, photomicrograph. And for some reason, that's associated with a better prognosis, especially if the FLT3 mutation's not there. And that's also been shown in older patients with chemotherapy. The complete remission rates are higher if the mutation is there, and the disease-free and overall survival is better. But it's not just the genetics of the disease that dictates the prognosis here, it's also the ability of an older patient to tolerate this intensive chemotherapy that leads to mucositis and consequences of myelosuppression, bleeding, and infection. Um, and so what are the patient factors that lead to early mortality or, or poor outcomes? Well, one of them obviously would be the number of comorbid illnesses that a patient has, and as we age, we we accumulate more comorbidities, we're on more medications over time. What I'm showing you here, I, I love this study from the French because it gives you um, uh, a glimpse as to what was just mentioned in the prior um, talk. Our studies often don't reflect who we see in clinic. So in this study they, where they took older people and treated them with intensive chemotherapy, they went back and went through the charts of these patients and asked what was their outcome in terms of survival related to the number of comorbid illnesses? And as you might expect, patients with three or more comorbidities, common things that you're caring for, uh, there, I know there are a bunch of internists in here, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, very common illnesses. If you have three or more, you had a much worse survival. But what's really important about this slide is what you see at the top there. Out of the 416 patients, only 21 or 5% had three or more comorbidities. There's clearly a selection of which patients go on clinical trials. We've also learned um, more recently that the functional and cognitive status of older patients might be very important. So these 
things, both patient-specific and uh, leukemia-specific factors, have been incorporated into models. This is an MD Anderson model that incorporates things that are specific to the patient, like older age and poor performance status, um, poor renal function, and then things uh, related to the disease. The unfavorable karyotype, as you can see, is, is on there. And these have been, in multivariate analysis, each of these features have been correlated with complete remission rate or eight-week mortality. Well, if you look at, um, uh, if you have none of those risk factors, that was actually the minority of patients with a 72% remission rate and 10% eight-week mortality. But if you only had three or more of any of those, you, which uh, accounted for a third of the patients, the CR rate was only 24% and the eight-week mortality, 57%. So this makes the point that we can change the outcome of a study based on the, the patient population. And this is why phase two studies, especially at single centers, are so difficult in older AML patients to extrapolate to the next patient you're gonna see. You don't often see all of the things that go into that decision. And it might be as, uh, of putting them on chemotherapy. It might be as something as simple as you ask Mrs. Jones to get up on the examining table and you can go and have a cup of coffee by the time she takes the four steps to the examining table. And that never gets captured in your case report forms. So we're using genetics to try to identify populations who don't benefit or do benefit from chemotherapy. Why apply an intensive chemotherapy to all patients and use resources, cause morbidity and mortality, when we already know enough from the last 30 or 40 years of work that these patients aren't gonna do well. So for example, this is a study from a colleague of mine, Guido Marcucci, who's now at City of Hope, and he used a gene expression profile that showed uh, that identified 15% of the population as doing very well with chemotherapy and the remainder not so well. This is data from the Europeans that was then validated in um, uh, a, a cooperative group in the United States showing that they can identify a quarter of patients based on patient-specific features, age, performance status, and genetics, nucleophosmin, uh, FLT3 mutation and another one, CEBP alpha, and identify patients who are going to do very poorly with intensive chemotherapy. Um, I'm the chair of a, uh, the cooperative group um, team designing the next study for older AML patients, and what we're trying to convince the NCI of is that we can identify patients who are going to do poorly with intensive chemo, and we have to think of new options for those patients. Otherwise, it's just this. We spend a lot of money on chromosomes and molecular diagnostics to tell, tell us that the patient is sick. And we have to go further than that. So how have we done with intensive chemotherapy? The current paradigm is the one we use in young people. We make a diagnosis, we give them intensive chemotherapy, usually an anthracycline like donorubicin or idorubicin and cytarabine to try to in induce a remission. If we do, then they go on to a consolidation um, either more chemotherapy or an allogeneic transplant, the goal of which is to prevent relapse or at least delay relapse. If they don't and have primary refractory disease, we will try some salvage chemotherapy that has very low efficacy. But if a patient relapses or doesn't respond, uh, relapses and gets salvaged or primary refractory disease and gets salvaged and responds, that small minority of highly selected patients, their only curative um, option is allogeneic transplant. So that's our paradigm. It makes a lot of sense when you're 20 years old. But when you're older, it's hard to get patients through it. There have been um, attempts to intensify what we do. We have better supportive care now for our patients. Maybe we can intensify the chemotherapy like we have in, in uh, younger patients. This is a study from, uh, the, uh, from Europe, uh, the Netherlands and Switzerland, showing that with a higher dose of donorubicin, the complete remission rate was higher, and more patients got into a remission with just one round of chemo, and it did not impact on early mortality. But in terms of overall survival for all the patients, there was no benefit. But if you look at people between 60 and 65, um, there was a benefit. Um, what I really think is going on here is that the Europeans select their patients very carefully for intensive chemotherapy. So a 65-year-old living um, in, at The Hague or in the Netherlands or in Switzerland is much more akin to a 55-year-old living in the United States. 
Well, you could try adding other therapies, and one way to do it is to target the leukemic blast. A drug that was approved by the FDA in 2000 is an antibody-targeted therapy against a cell surface molecule of the AML blast called CD33. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody that's covalently linked to a very powerful toxin called calichiomycin. This was approved because a quarter of older patients with relapse disease responded to um, a single or two infusions of this drug that didn't cause mucositis or, or hair loss and cardiac toxicity. Well, the French have incorporated this into chemotherapy in a fractionated schedule, and they showed that there was no difference in remission rate, but they actually showed a statistically significant benefit in the disease-free survival and overall survival. However, right when they were publishing this case, this uh, study, the FDA took this drug, gemtuzumab azogamycin, mylotarg, off the market based on one other study in younger patients combining it with chemotherapy showing no benefit. And then you could think about other chemotherapy drugs. Clofarabine is one that I've been involved in. It's a novel purine analog. Um, uh, Hagob Contargen and I ran a multi-center phase two trial in the United States, and we thought we were really selecting patients who were not fit or did not want chemotherapy. And so it was a selection. We clearly selected patients um, for this study. A third of them had an antecedent hematologic disorder and 10% had treatment-related AML. And a half of them had unfavorable karyotypes and we just gave them single agent clofarabine. And you could just think of that as one drug is usually not as, as toxic as two drugs that we usually use. This table just reminds me to tell you we saw responses that seem similar to what we would see with intensive chemotherapy. And so the cooperative groups have done a study comparing, comparing standard chemotherapy with donorubicin and ARC for induction and cytarabine for consolidation with clofarabine. Uh, we had high hopes for the study. It was closed by the Data Safety Monitoring Committee two, uh, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, because of worse survival in the clofarabine arm. So we're not accruing to the study at this point. Well, how about delivering the chemotherapy more towards the leukemic blast and in a, in a more uh, efficacious um, amounts. There's in vitro data and model, animal model data showing that if the ratio of the donorubus and the anthracycline to ARC is exactly five to one, for some reason, leukemic blasts are more sensitive. But when we, have, uh, when we order these chemo drugs, we're squirting in donorubicin over 10 to 15 minutes on the first three days and giving ARC continuously for seven days, that ratio is not maintained in the patient. And so a drug company, Celator, um, encapsulated donorubicin and ARC into this perfect five to one molar ratio. And what they found was it was actually um, accumulated in the bone marrow blast and was selective for the bone marrow blast. You might think, well, um, maybe in the studies that I'm about to show you, they gave more of the chemotherapy, and this just reminds me to tell you that the actual total amounts of chemo were actually lower with the experimental agent than with our standard chemotherapy. And then this wordy slide, again, you have all these slides if you want to look at them later. This just says, in this randomized phase two study, there was a higher remission rate, and there was lower early mortality with um, the liposomal encapsulated uh, drug. And so this went on to a phase three study that is uh, close to accrual last year and we're waiting for the results. Once you get him into a remission, then what? Well, for younger patients, we think about high dose ARC or allogeneic transplant. The studies of high dose ARC showed no benefit in older patients versus just a standard chemotherapy. Other things have been tried, number, you know, increasing the number of cycles of chemotherapy, changing the drugs. Really nothing has been shown to be helpful, um, in fact, or better. In fact, some of us question, what is the true benefit of giving more chemotherapy to these patients? If we give patients chemotherapy with the attendant risks over the next two to three months, and that's really their only benefit of an extra uh, two to three months of life, does that make sense to do it? 
We still attempt to get patients to analogenic stem cell transplant in first remission because we think that has the best anti-leukemic effect, at least in younger patients. But this was a very instructive feasibility study from MD Anderson. It has been questioned, it, uh, the, the generalis, generalis, it's not sure we can generalize from this study because at MD Anderson, there's not the best cooperation between the bone marrow transplant doctors and the leukemia doctors. Having said that, they had 250 patients who walked through the doors of MD Anderson over the age of 50, not 60, not 65, over 50. And I'm 57, so 50 is not old, okay? And they got chemotherapy, 40% went into a remission, and they were all supposed to get a transplant consult, and if they had a donor, get, get a um, uh, transplant. Well, out of the 250 that came through the doors of MD Anderson, 14 actually got the transplant. And that's in the yellow line, they did better. Did they do better because they got the transplant? Or did they do better because they were 14 out of 250 who, where the biology of the patient and the biology of the disease was such that they were gonna do that well with chemotherapy anyways? So should we even give intensive chemotherapy What's the data that giving these patients intensive chemotherapy is beneficial? There's only one randomized trial from a very long time ago published by the French showing that with intensive chemotherapy that I just described, more patients achieved a remission than a low dose of RSC that could be given as an outpatient. Um, and there were actually fewer um, infections with the low dose RSC um, and fewer fatal infections and less time in the hospital and actually no difference in overall survival or duration of those remissions, whether they got a very palliative low-dose RSC or intensive chemotherapy. But oncologists say, well, that was 20 years ago, and we're much better at supporting these patients through treatment. Um, and so it's not, it, there will never be a study comparing these two again. So with all of that, it shouldn't be um, uh, that unexpected that only 44% of Medicare recipients in the 1990s received any, over, yeah, over the age of 65, received any form of intravenous chemotherapy. And you can see in red there, with advancing age, the, I said that wrong, only 30% had chemotherapy. And with advancing age, the number of patients who got um, IV chemotherapy went down. And yet, 90% of patients are hospitalized because of the complications of the disease. Very few of these patients go on to hospice care because hospice does not allow, in general, transfusion support, which can actually improve quality of life and possibly even quantity of life in these patients. And we know from these um, uh, studies that patients who did get chemotherapy had a longer survival, but the patients who got chemotherapy also tend to be younger and have fewer comorbidities, so not a randomized trial. So we now use less intensive um, therapies uh, for um, uh, patients with AML. And let me show you the data for that. And I'm gonna start with a patient, because this is a patient that was referred to me by John Dubay over in Tuscaloosa. A 69-year-old man presents with fatigue and dyspnea on exertion, 69 looking 79, but there's really no algorithm for that, but we know it when we see it. You could see his comorbidities, a lot of arterial uh, or vascular disease with past CVA and coronary artery disease, chronic renal insufficiency, COPD, diabetes that's been complicated by neuropathy, and he actually had another cancer and got some form of chemo for it, but can't remember what it was. A performance status of two, and presents with pancytopenia, a, um, um, AML in the, in the marrow, and the chromosome analysis shows monosomies, that's what um, that arrow over the two is, that's missing a chromosome two, and you can see it's missing a chromosome 20. So there are monosomies, and then there are other deletions of parts of chromosome five and seven, a very high risk chromosomal abnormality. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time, it's a bit of the nuances. Um, we have learned that patients with this type of karyotype, monosomal karyotype, where chromosomes are missing, have a very poor survival with intensive chemotherapy. It's those, um, I guess I'll point with this, these lines here, whether it's a complex karyotype or not. So in these patients, if we're gonna to attempt to give chemotherapy, we might think about giving low-dose RSC. This is an instructive study from the United Kingdom. They had a study where 
patients could be randomly assigned to get either intensive chemos or non-intensive chemos. And I'm going to show you the non-intensive chemo, hydrea and, and ARAC. But they could be randomized. And in that study, they had 206 patients treated with the less intensive. Now, of the 206, six were randomly assigned to it. The 200 were assigned by their doctor because the doctor and the patients felt that they knew which one they wanted. But there, they, we really have no way of making that decision um, from any kind of algorithm. So no randomized data comparing intensive to non-intensive anymore, but this is comparing low-dose ARAC to hydroxyurea, and there was a higher remission rate of 18% with low-dose ARAC, but the benefit was only seen in patients with normal chromosomes or favorable risk karyotypes, not in the patients with unfavorable karyotype. Well, maybe a different drug might do better, and in fact, clofarabine was tested compared to low-dose ARAC, and I'm showing this because it makes a point. They increased the total remission rate with clofarabine versus low-dose ARAC. There was a slight increase in uh, 30 and 60-day mortality with the clofarabine, and no difference in overall survival. How about if you add drugs to low-dose ARAC? This is a polo-like kinase inhibitor. The polo-like kinases are involved in mitosis. Um, this one, Velasertib, um, from Beringer Ingelheim, is an investigational agent, and it was tested um, in combination with low-dose ARAC versus low-dose ARAC alone. And what they showed was a higher remission rate, and there was also in this randomized phase two study an apparent benefit in overall survival and event-free survival, but the study wasn't really powered to look at that, and so this is um, just completing a large randomized phase three study. I'm gonna just show you some data from the Italians. Making, I wanna make the point that I think it's important to try to treat these patients with something. So remember, gemtuzumab azogamycin, now off the market, um, uh, has been used in older patients with AML. And the Italians did this study where they took patients who were unfit for intensive chemotherapy, either because of performance status or just because of age, and they randomly assigned them to get gemtuzumab azogamycin on this schedule or best supportive care. There was a clear survival benefit of giving gemtuzumab azogamycin, and, but the survival benefit was seen in patients where the leukemic blast had a high le higher level of the target, CD33. It was only seen, again, in patients with favorable and intermediate risk karyotypes. And the response rates also correlated with CD33 expression and the karyotype. But this is the, the point I want to make, not specifically about the drug, but look at best supportive care. These are the adverse events. There was no difference in the adverse events that were captured, either all together or grade three or greater. But deaths due to AEs, infections, bleeding, was actually higher with best supportive care than gemtuzumab because remember, these patients are gonna be at risk of infections and of bleeding regardless of whether you treat them or not. And the same is shown here, similar rates of infection um, uh, and other complications among uh, the, uh, the various treatments, actually a higher rate of fatigue with the best supportive care. Well, the hypomethylating agents, which you heard about, have been used. Um, this is a French study showing that there's responses that can be seen in uh, patients uh, with AML. There's now been a randomized clinical trial done comparing azacitidine to whatever the doctor wanted to give the patient, either intensive chemo, low-dose ARC, or best supportive care. Two-thirds of the patients actually were assigned to get low-dose ARC by their doctor, and they were randomized between aza and low-dose ARC, and the other third were um, divided between best supportive care and intensive chemo. There was a trend for an improvement in overall survival with azacitidine, and there was an improvement in survival when you censored for getting a different kind of treatment. But the reason why I'm showing this is that our meeting at, uh, in San Francisco in December, uh, the investigator showed that patients like the one I just presented with myelodysplasia-related changes had an improvement in survival with azacitidine, and those with complex poor risk karyotypes also had a statistically significant improvement in survival. But obviously, by two years, these patients, uh, most of them have died. So clearly, um, uh, a benefit um, 
in terms of improving survival but um, in the short term but not the long term. And just uh, for completeness, I put in your handout data for a different hypomethylating agent, Decidabeam, that was compared to low-dose ARAC. There was a higher remission rate. Um, there was really no statistical difference, although there was a trend in improvement in survival. So does it matter? The next patient who comes into your office who's over the age of 65, does it matter if you say, let's do a trial of an epigenetic therapy like azacitabine and decitabine or give intensive chemo? Well, we don't really know. But MD Anderson has published their data. MD Anderson has a, a long tradition of giving very intensive chemotherapy to older patients. But more recently, they've got on the bandwagon of giving less intensive therapies and azacitidine and histone deacetylase inhibitor-based therapies. Uh, I'm sorry, hypomethylene agents or histone deacetylase inhibitors. And so this is just a retrospective comparison of chemotherapy-treated patients and those treated with epigenetic therapies, higher response rates with chemotherapy. There was a trend for a higher early death rate, but it was just a trend, but a higher early death rate with chemotherapy, but there was no difference in overall or relapse-free survival. Hopefully, we're going to be able to get better at targeting the population for intensive chemotherapy. Um, uh, I'm sorry, for these hypomethylating agents. And this is just one paper recently that showed that um, mutations in TET2, but not in uh, ASXL1, correlated with response to the hypomethylating agents. So let me finish um, with this case. Um, uh, that's a patient with relapse disease. Most of these patients are going to relapse after intensive chemotherapy, and then what? So this is a patient that uh, we are treating now up at UAB, a 63-year-old man who presents with acute myeloid leukemia with a normal karyotype and no, none of those mutations. He gets standard intensive chemotherapy, goes into a remission. He declines allogeneic stem cell transplant first remission, although he was clearly eligible for it. Um, gets chemotherapy as consolidation, and then 10 months into his first remission has recurrent disease. But now, as Dr. Clarkson was saying, now we found something new. And we did the first one, Dr. Clarkson, and didn't find it, and now we found something new. So it happens, you're exactly right. There's clonal evolution, new genetic changes can occur. And so he has an MLL gene rearrangement. And I'll mention why that's important later. So what can we tell this guy? Well, we could tell him uh, that his prognosis is going to vary based on the duration of that first remission, the cytogenetics, his age, and whether he had a prior stem cell transplant. If you look at those risk factors in this patient, and this is a run-of-the-mill relapse, not too bad, he falls into this group, which was actually the majority who have this survival. You could see a median survival of somewhere around five months. So um, there is no standard of care. We, most of us use a high-dose ARC-based regimen. Bosaroxin is um, an, an investigational agent, not FDA-approved for anything at this point. It um, is a first-in-class quinolone derivative. It is not a substrate for P53. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it is P53 independent in terms of activity and not a substrate for a um, uh, pump to pump out the uh, drug. So um, I was on the scientific steering committee of this very large randomized trial of standard of care, which is high or intermediate dose ARC versus intermediate dose ARC with bosaroxin. This just shows you that in older patients, the remission rates were higher with bosaroxin compared to the intermediate dose ARC. There was a um, trend in the primary analysis for improvement in survival, but more importantly, because we're talking about older AML, in the subpopulation that was stratified, 451 patients, so a huge population, there was a statistically significant benefit in terms of survival, but now leukemia doctors are arguing is a two-month difference in median survival meaningful? I guess we should ask our patients if two months is meaningful. We shouldn't ask the company if two months is meaningful, but patients. And if you look at the, this patient who had a 10-month um, first remission, there was an improvement in survival as well without a difference in mortality. Well, he gets chemotherapy, not on that study, but with high-dose ARC, flag, and then MEC, no response, no response. What do you do? Well, this is where you, we think about uh, one area where we think about investigational agents. There are a lot of things being developed. Let me just show you a couple of things that have been presented at, at ASH recently. 
And this one um, is, an, is um, pertinent to this patient. The MLL gene rearrangement creates a fusion protein with a protein called MLL, and that changes chromatin structure by recruiting a, um, um, a, a, meth, a histone methylase called histone H3 lysine 79 um, um, uh, methylase. So you get aberrant methylation of histones, which are important in chromatin structure. That leads to aberrant gene activation and leukemogenesis. There is a small molecule inhibitor uh, of um, that uh, DOT1L, which is the um, histone uh, methyl transferase. And in uh, this phase one study, eight of 34 patients with an MLL gene rearrangement had some type of response. For example, this patient that they showed at ASH had leukemia cutis, which you can see on the biopsy and on her skin. And by cycle four, day one, the leukemia cutis had, had gone away. Why those eight out of 34 responded, we, we don't know. This is a drug that we're uh, investigating at uh, UAB. We were, uh, along with other institutions, we put the first patient on this phase one study. It's a different anti-CD33 immunotoxin. It's a different antibody, a different linker, a different uh, payload. Instead of clechiomycin, it's a pyrolobenzodiazepine. But it works the same way by targeting the leukemic blast and causing double-stranded DNA breaks. Um, it has uh, the toxicity you would expect for chemotherapy in um, uh, AML, especially infectious complications. But we saw responses. In fact, most patients have reduction in bone marrow blast, and we even saw complete um, remissions um, with this agent. So it's undergoing further testing. And I'll finish then with just a mention of um, uh, uh, inhibitors of IDH, because this is just too cool, because you thought you didn't have to remember the Krebs cycle anymore, and you're wrong, okay? So here we go. It turns out that um, what Dr. Clarkson was talking about in terms of epigenetics, epigenetic modulation and putting methyl groups on DNA, an enzyme involved in the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, called isocitrate dehydrogenase is important in, pr in producing a substrate, um, substrates that affect methylation of DNA and specifically the conversion of alpha-ketoglutarate to 2-hydroxyglutarate. And the ratio of these two will lead to changes in epigenetics. There are activating mutations in um, uh, the IDH2 and also IDH1, which is in the cytoplasm, molecules in about 5 to 10 percent of patients. Now, obviously, if you had an inhibitor against IDH, you're going to shut down the Krebs cycle in your body, and that's probably not good. I remember that much about the Krebs cycle. Pretty important. But if you have a specific inhibitor against IDH, the IDH2 uh, mutation, that might be a benefit. And in fact, in this phase one study, they showed half of the patients who received this oral medication for usually for relapse disease with an IDH2 mutation had a response. So there are things coming, obviously, and so, so the, my approach to the majority of my AML patients who are older is to, first of all, you consider the patient's life expectancy prior to the diagnosis of AML. But barring any other life-threatening uh, diseases at the time, I always attempt to give some anti-leukemic therapy. And the reason for that is with less intensive therapies, um, even if you don't give them, you're still going to be giving the patient supportive care. Very rarely do we send patients directly to hospice unless they have some other um, immediately life-threatening disease um, uh, that's going on. And usually nothing is more life-threatening than the AML. So I attempt to give an anti-leukemic therapy. The goal of my therapy, like in any other cancer, has to be considered. Are you thinking about curative approaches? You don't want to miss the older patient with potentially curable leukemia? Or is it a palliative approach? And we use the genetics of the disease and the patient characteristics to help with that in terms of their ability to tolerate treatment. I think clinical trials are very important in this area for the newly diagnosed patient and the relapsed patient. And of course, like everything else we do in oncology, we have to educate our patients about their options so that they can be involved in making choices based on their preferences and their life goals at that point in their life. With that, I'll stop and uh, thank you.